Femi, your host on this show. We're live from the national headquarters of Nigeria's premier anti-narcotic agency, the NDLA, right at the heart of uh, Nigeria's federal capital territory, Abuja. We'd like to welcome everyone joining us from across Nigeria and um, those um, listening to us in other parts of the world, Europe, America, Asia, Middle East, and the rest of Africa. It's our pleasure hosting you on this platform today, and um, we do hope um, we're going to be having some awesome conversation. We already have our guest in the right on the platform and well seated on the speaker's um, table. And um, in a short while, we'll be introducing her, and thereafter, uh, we'll start the conversation. But let's um, first um, start with some of the preliminary things we do. Um, on the space just to keep us uh, updated about the activities of the agency and thereafter we'll move to the presentation the interrogation and uh, the question and answer session okay uh, but before then would like to tell us that indeed this is a platform where we share information knowledge and raise awareness about uh, substance abuse and its devastating impact on uh, human rights public health and our environment. This platform also serves as a channel, like I said before, of providing um, help to those struggling with substance abuse who indeed need treatment. It is also um, a means to update um, you, um, our partners, our stakeholders, and indeed the citizenry, whether here or in diaspora, about uh, the activities of um, the agency. Um, about the activities of the agency, especially what we're doing to curb the scourge of substance abuse and trafficking. Everyone has given your feedback so that we can continue to improve on what we do to serve you, that is the society and humanity better. Um, this conversation would also like to inform everyone um, on this space that um, this conversation is recorded and is streamed live on our other social media handles, especially at NDLE01 on Facebook and um, at NDLE underscore Nigeria on YouTube. So you can always go back and um, take a listen to the recording and even share with um, others. That way, those um, that probably miss the live uh, streaming can um, still benefit from the conversation, the knowledge, and um, all the information that will be shared in the course of this um, discussion today. But before I invite our guest to make her presentation, indeed, um, I can tell you that um, it's somebody that um, quite a number of us might have come across someone that you, um, quite a number of us might have um, come across our post and presentations um, on social media or elsewhere, but indeed um, is someone that is well knowledgeable about um, what we are going to be discussing here today. And um, we're not expecting anything less than indeed she's going to be um, giving a good account of herself. Uh, that is um, that is um, who we have we have on the space. I remind you of some of the activities of the agency this past week, and that will come in our news alert segment. And um, already we're seated um, to update us on uh, some of these activities that's in our news and I, I mean highlight segment um, I have uh, two beautiful ladies in the house already that's blessing Tafa and um, Neta where does it? 
let's um, welcome them. Please, um, ladies, I pass the mic to you now. Let's uh, quickly get the updates from you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Good day to everyone, and thank you for joining us on this week's X Space. My name is Blessing Torfa, and I'm being joined on this segment by Netta Reduzi. Here are the NDLEA news highlights for the week. First, the headlines. NDLEA uncovers illicit drug consignment in commercial bus engine, arrest two grandpas, bus two scooches factories in Oshun, Lagos. And now the details. Operators of the National Drug Law Enforcement Agency, NDLEA, have intercepted a consignment of illicit drug concealed in the engine compartment of an interstate commercial bus, just as two grandfathers were taken into custody over drug trafficking. No fewer than 5.2 kilograms of cannabis, sativa, and opioids were discovered in the engine compartment of an interstate commercial bus marked VDY-187XA on Thursday, 7 March, along Bongon Ibadan Road, Oshun State, by NDLEA officers on stop and search operation on the highway. The bus driver, Lord Liam Shugnan Dominic, 35, who took responsibility for the concealment, was taken into custody for further investigation. The previous day, Wednesday, 6 March, a 26-year-old lady, Obasami Esther Iyalu, who produces and distributes coaches, was arrested during a raid on her hideout in Oshogbo, the Oshun State capital. At least 16.5 liters of the illicit substance and different quantities of molly and cannabis were recovered from her during the raid. In the same vein, NDL operatives in Borno State have arrested a 70-year-old grandfather, Marlon Mege Adam and 65-year-old Yamama Musa for drug trafficking. They were arrested on Saturday, 9th March, along with 24-year-old Abubakar Yao and Babagana Abubakar Ali, 28, in Nidugri and Gamburu Ngala, respectively, while 32,000 ampules of Tamador injection were recovered from them. Same day, operatives at Gaidam in Yobe State intercepted a Gulf 3 salon car heading to Gagamari in Niger Republic, where the occupant, Al Hajimala Tijani, 28, was to deliver 40 blocks of cannabis weighing 24.5 kilograms, another dealer, while 42 cartons containing 8,400 bottles of codeine syrup weighing 1,260 kilograms were recovered from the driver, Mutari Yao, 29, at Katina Road, Kaduna, until Tuesday, 5th March. In Kano State, Nura Yusuf, 35, was arrested with 62 kilograms cannabis at Gadar Tamburawa area where Abu Bakr Sani, 40, was also nabbed with 244 bottles of codeine syrup, while Muhammad Al-Kali, 28, was found with 49,800 pills of tramadol along Kano Medugui Road on Thursday, 7th March. This is just as NDLU operatives in Lagos State on Wednesday, 6 March, arrested Abba farmers at Ibo Eleri area of the state, where it 4 liters of scoochies, 1.1 liters of codeine syrup, 4 kilograms cannabis sativa, and 800 tablets of tramadol, 225 milligrams were seized from him. No fewer than eight suspects were arrested on Friday, 8th March, where NDLA officers raided the notorious Karu Abattoir drug joint in FCT Abuja, with 51.3 kilograms cannabis recovered from them. Those arrested include Buhari Mohammedu, Demilu Mohammed, Abubakar Wapa, Yahaya Tassio, Ezekiel Muranda, Abba Haruna, Habib Umar, and Shamsul Lawali. In Plateau State, two suspects, Pam Thomas, 45, and Stephen Nyam, 38, were on Monday, 4th March, arrested with cannabis weighing 611.428 kilograms at Zawan just south. While in Kogi State, NDLA officers intercepted a commercial J5 bus coming from Onichanamba State to Zaria Kaduna State on Wednesday, 6th March, along Okene Lokoja Abu Budget Expressway where a total of 8,580 pills of tamadol and exhaust 5 were seized from a suspect, Yusuf Abdullahi 40. In Enugu, operatives on Tuesday, 5th March, raided some locked-up shops at the new market in Enugu metropolitan area, where 371.42 kilograms cannabis and 9.49 grams of methamphetamine were recovered. While commending the efforts of the Borno, Kogi, Kaduna, Kano, Oshun, Lagos, Plateau, Enugu, Yobe, and FCT commands of the agency for jobs well done in the past week, the Chairman Chief Executive Officer of NDLEA, Brigadier General Mohamed Bibamora, retired, charged them and their compatriots in other formations nationwide not to rest on their oars as they continue to intensify their drug supply reduction and drug demand reduction activities. That's it on the rest and seizures. Over to you, Nata. Thank you, Blessing. My name is Meta Wedezi, and here are some of the weather activities across the country for the week. As communities grapple with the multi-phase impact of drug abuse, 
which are not limited to the threat posed to individual well-being, but also a significant contribution to broader societal issues such as crime, public health, and strained social services, there arises a critical need for a concerted effort to raise awareness and cultivate a culture of informed decision-making. The war against drug abuse rather advocacy initiative is a goal of society approach employed by the NDLEA, which not only addresses the immediate consequences of substance abuse, but also empowers individuals with the knowledge and tools to make informed choices, ultimately fostering a safer and more supportive environment for all. These enlightenment programs are facilitated by NDLEA commands nationwide to drive this objective. On Monday, 4th March 2024, the Special Area Command delivered a wider sensitization lecture to students and teachers of Kingdom Heritage School Badagri. The Cardinal State Command delivered the same to 1,320 students of Government Secondary School, Madakia Kapanchan, local government area, and the Kogi State Command to the students and teachers of Salem Pamarian Secondary School, Lokoja. The River State Command on Tuesday, 5th March, paid a wider advocacy visit to the paramount ruler of Rumwakba Kingdom, His Royal Highness, Dr. Tempo Ejeko, highlighting the role of leaders in influencing the drug war at the community level. The Ocean State Command also paid a similar advocacy visit to His Royal Majesty, Oba Enok Ademola Akinyemi, the Owa Oyo of Imesi Ili, Obokun local government area, on Wednesday, 6 March. Still on Wednesday, the Yobe State Command facilitated an enlightenment program at Ali Marame Junior Secondary School, Damaturu. The Kano State Command at Comprehensive Secondary School, Bichi. The Ogun State Command at Ogumo High School, Abeokuta. And the Oya State Command at St. Anne's School, Molote Ibadon. Continuing the wider sensitization programs on Thursday, 7th March, by the Lagos State Command to the students of the Finance High School, Sango Tedo Leki, the Adamawa State Command to the students and teachers of Government Secondary School, Mayabawa, and the Zone I Command to the students and teachers of Ansar Udin High School and Kingdom Heritage International School, Arameta Ibadan. Friday, 8th March, saw the conclusion of the water activities for the previous week, with no less than four commands organizing lectures same day. The Imo State Command and the Anambra State Command, with sensitization lectures to students and teachers of Catch Them Young Academy, Afro Bay, and St. John's Anglican School, Nisei, respectively. While the Ekiti and Abia State Commands paid advocacy visits to the First Ladies of their respective state of command, Her Excellency, Dr. Mrs. Olayemi First Lady of Ekiti State, and Her Excellency Mrs. Priscilla Oti, the First Lady of Abia State. That's the update for this week. My name is Netta, and I had you over to our host, Mr. Femi Baba Femi. Very well, thank you there, um, Netta, and um, blessing. I appreciate you guys. Thank you for that quick update. Now, let me... Um, Okay, welcome us back from the news highlight segment. We have quite um, a number of our compatriots already on this space. Like I said before, we already have our guest speaker right where seated, and um, I'm seeing our friends uh, from across uh, the US, the UK, also were seated on this space. Okay, we'll be getting, we'll be acknowledging and um, mentioning names in uh, a bit, but then. Um, Let's quickly remind us about some of the rules guiding our engagement on this program. Um, please note that when we approve you to be on the speaker's um, uh, corner, please ensure that you remain muted until after our guest presentation, and then uh, we'll start inviting individuals to um, unmute themselves to ask um, their questions, interrogate the presentation by our guest, or even make contributions in few seconds. Um, please also know that we do encourage unauthorized interruption. We don't discuss policies uh, strictly um, on this issue of uh, drug abuse and how uh, we can address or how we can salvage um, the present situation, not just in Nigeria, but um, globally. But then our focus is on Nigeria primarily. Okay, so let's stick to this rule so that we can all enjoy and benefit from the conversation. Would always appreciate you. Thank you uh, for your usual cooperation. Um, okay, so before we introduce our guest again, I would also like to tell us about uh, quickly about uh, the NDLA's um, call center where we have um, our professionals ranging from um, our counselors, psychologists, psychotherapists, and um, uh, psychiatric doctors, all um, a wide range of uh, mental health experts, and um, 
all of these people uh, work 24-7 around the clock at our call center where they provide psychosocial support um, for those in need. We have um, dedicated um, toll-free helpline that anybody from any part of the country uh, can sit in the comfort of their homes and uh, dial this number to um, discuss with um, uh, experts, call them and uh, seek for help. Then they, will, they are well um, <clears throat> skilled and they're well positioned to provide support for anyone who need uh, support. Like I said, we have a toll-free helpline, which is 0800-1020-3040. Again, I'd like to call, um, repeat, the toll-free helpline is 0800. Like I often say, this number, it's a 12-digit, not the regular 11-digit um, GSM line. It's a 12-digit number. So it's 0800-1020-3040. You can always call that um number and get the needed help and um, they will definitely assess um, your situation if perhaps you are the one or it's your relation or friend they will assess the situation and if they need to uh, also refer you for a uh, check-in into um, a treatment center they would um, give you a uh, link you up with the nearest treatment center to you and then follow up with your treatment and eventually support in the process of um, reintegrating you back um, to your family or your community. All of these services are provided by a call center. In addition to that, we also like to tell us that um, the center is uh, language sensitive, meaning that if you can't speak English or pidgin, uh, our experts at the center can also provide support for you uh, in any of the three major Nigerian languages, that is Hausa, Yoruba, and Igbo. That, um, that uh, with that, um, nobody really has an um, excuse not to seek for help in case um, you have, um, um, you're struggling with substance abuse. That's that because there is the assurance that um, um, the, um, the, the fear of stigmatization is out of it and um, you can rest assured nobody will judge you. So that's that. Let me quickly also tell us about um, um, our drug uh, test kits, which are already available in all our commands across the country. Um, our test kits, um, they are to provide, um, uh, it's available for tests in all our commands, and even that can be used by parents um, in their homes, in the comfort of their homes, just to clear all doubts about um, the drug status of um, their kids or their loved ones. So, it's a five minutes uh, test product and it has 11 panel UDT kits available. It's available in a Q cup and a cartridge. Um, uh, we can also tell you that uh, this is um, <clears throat> Nigerian government um, approved test kits. It's just one of those things we're doing to support um, families and homes, even including schools, to ensure that. Um, we cut down on the demand for uh, substance abuse because when these um, the young ones know that indeed they are likely to be tested by their parents at home or even um, in any of the facilities, uh, there is that um, element of um, step back or fear of um, what they don't know or what they are like, what's likely to um, come out of that. So it's very comfortable to use. And um, like I said, it can be used in homes, hospitals, and um, very light to carry um, uh, around and it's reliable. It's uh, test results, I can tell you, is 99.9% .9 correct and um, it's accurate. Also enhances uh, clean testing ethics. So that's that. Let me come back to uh, the business of the day. Now um, we have um, already in the house, as I said, um, okay, um, let me quickly acknowledge some of um, uh, people, then I go back to introduce um, our guest today. Um, I've seen, um, okay, uh, a senior member of the platform, Dr. Abdullah. Dr. Abdullah is joining us via um, SL Mental Health Foundation. Dr. Abdullah is a consultant psychiatrist at the Amadoubele University, um, and Amadoubele University Teaching Hospital, Zaria. Thank you very much, Dr. I've also seen our friend, um, Dr. Loretta. Dr. Loretta is joining us from um, Chicago, Illinois. Thank you, Loretta. I know it's very early in the morning where you are. I've also seen um, John Ogunjimi. Thank you, John. Um, I've also seen Suleiman. 
uh, Ibrahim Kuru. Ibrahim is joining us from the northeast. Um, that's um, in Nigeria here. We have um, also, okay, I've also seen uh, Oku Deji, that's Adeji Adi Sudo, also joining us. Okay, um, I've also seen Comrade uh, Mo, Comrade Mo, that's at um, uh, Mawa. All right, we have quite um, a number of people who will be appreciating, I mean, acknowledging each and everyone as time goes by. But quickly, let's um, listen to Dr. Um, Show. Okay. Well, I think I'm letting out the cat out of the bag or just uh, putting them. Um... All right, our guest today is uh, Dr. Itunui Johnson Sobetun. I guess, I think I got that right. Okay, popularly known as Dr. Show. Uh, Dr. Show is a highly experienced UK-based general practitioner with a strong commitment to the holistic well-being of her patients. She specializes in family medicine and has a deep understanding of the biopsychosocial factors that influence health. Her clinical experience spans over a decade during which she has excelled in both the National Health Service and the private sector. National Health Service, that's talking of UK, I guess. All right, Dr. Show's particular areas of interest include women's health, sexual and reproductive health, and the menopause care. She's a member of the British... Um, she's a member of the British... Menopause Society and the Primary Care Women's Health Forum, where she serves as um, on the Rock My Menopause Committee. She's also actively involved in the RCGP Northwest London Faculty Board, where she leads the equity, equality, diversity, and inclusion strategy to promote health equality and um, create opportunities for underrepresented GPs. In addition to her medical career, Dr. Johnson um, Shobertun is an educator working as a GP tutor and examiner at Queen Mary's University of London Medical School. She balances her professional life with her roles as a wife, a mother, and a mother, drawing, her, drawing personal insight from her own experiences to connect with and understand the challenges faced by her patients. All right, okay. So at this point, I would like to <clears throat> please um, invite you to Germany and welcoming Dr. Shu as I invite her to unmute herself while we listen to her discuss our topic today, and that, that is the triple threat biopsychosocial impact of cannabis on mental health for the next 40 minutes or thereabout. Please um, go ahead uh, with your presentation, Dr. Shu. You are very much welcome. Thank you. Hello, um, Mr. Baba Femi. Thank you so much for that introduction and thank you all for having me. I feel very honored uh, to have been invited to ha uh, have this conversation in this space. So, uh, where I was raised, I was raised in Ibadan, Nigeria and lived there for the first 15 years of my life before I moved to the UK. And I've always maintained a strong connection home and go home a lot. Um, and my parents and my family are still based in Nigeria. Um, so one of the things that I think this topic makes this topic very um, pertinent for me was that, you know, at the very, when I became qualified as a doctor, um, and, you know, we have a, what you call a Nigeria house officer, but we have, we call it foundation doctor in um, the UK. So one of my foundation doctor jobs um, was in um, mental health. And I got onto the ward and I began to notice that many of the patients were young black men. Um, with serious conditions like psychosis, schizophrenia, uh, and the likes. And there was always a very strong tie to cannabis and cannabis smoking. And that was when I realized that ah, this thing is a real big issue. And I'm not sure how many young people know about the risks of cannabis smoking to their mental health. So I'm delighted to be sharing about this because it's so important to educate our young people because things that may seem like, oh, it's part of, uh, you know, the norm, you know, it's, it's a social thing. People might not recognize the severe risks, actually, that 
can happen with their um, mental health. So um, what, you, you know, we know that cannabis or uh, marijuana, as uh, some people call it, is a psychoactive drug derived from the cannabis plant. And in this talk, we're going to be considering um, the biopsychosocial impacts of cannabis use on mental health, uh, particularly in black people. Okay, so we're going to start with a, a case scenario. So we're going to call um, the, the person Kunle. He's a 19-year-old. Um, he entered university with very bright uh, prospects. But unfortunately, uh, whilst he was socializing in university, in his friendship group, people who were using cannabis, this was not before, but he began to see it as something that maybe he should try. And he started using cannabis. But um, when he started using it, initially it seemed like, oh, you know, it was a way to relax. But then he began to experience difficulties with reality and started having psychotic episodes. And with the stress of school, he was struggling to keep up. And eventually, he couldn't cope anymore. And um, some of his friends called him. Um, you know, his mother felt that perhaps he needed spiritual help. Um, so she took him to a pastor uh, for deliverance. But unfortunately, this did not help and his condition got worse. Um, so unfortunately, Kunle wasn't able to get the help that he needed because he wouldn't... Um, you know, there was conflicting information about sticking to a treatment plan. Um, he found himself still struggling with the cannabis ad addiction uh, and his mental health got worse and worse. And so he was unable to com uh, complete his education, meaning that he was also facing discrimination and became quite ostracized because he wasn't in a situation where he could be part of his family and be functional. Um, and so he became ostracized in community. Now, this is that we really do not want to see happening, but unfortunately, uh, does happen. Um, now, talking about the general overview of cannabis use uh, in Africa and Nigeria specifically, Africa has a global high prevalence rate of cannabis use with an estimated 13.2% of adults using it. And this data is from 2019. So that's quite a high percentage. And of course, um, we need to think about what the cultural, social and economic causes of people feeling that they need to use uh, substances. Um, and there's varied use across the continent. Um, but in Nigeria, we have a 10.8% use according to the 2018 National Drug Use Survey. And cannabis is the most commonly used drug in Nigeria, showing high prevalence amongst males aged 25 to 39. And there is also this cultural part of uh, uh, cannabis use seen as um, something for people who are creative or in that creative world. Um, um, and there is that feeling of acceptability uh, in that in those contexts for cannabis use, and that has made it uh, popular amongst young people who see it as cool, um, and this drives the use of cannabis um, in our community. Now, there are biological impacts of cannabis on Black mental health. And I think it's really important to recognize that cannabis interacts with the brain's endocannabinoid uh, system, and that can impact cognition, emotions, appetite, and that's why often after using cannabis, people can feel very hungry and overeat, and motor control. Now, heavy adolescent cannabis use can actually 
alter brain structure and function leading to brain impairments so just listen to that it can alter brain structure and function and especially when you're using it because our brains are still forming um up until the age of 25 so when you use cannabis at that young age it can actually alter brain structure and function and that can lead to problems later on in life but we also know that there are certain genetic factors certain genetic mutations that can increase susceptibility in black individuals to cannabis induced psychosis and mental health disorders so this means that there are certain genes that are prevalent in the black community that if you do take cannabis those genes increase your risk of getting psychosis now we don't all go around doing our genetic testing so we don't know who has those genes and who doesn't but we know that those genes exist and they're quite common in the black community and that is why we see a preponderance of psychosis and schizophrenia in the black community when um, cannabis is used. We see that strong association. Now, genetics may also influence the risk of developing cannabis use disorder. So this is something separate. This is that some people have a genetic disposition and this is again more we, we know that there are certain mutations within the black community and research has been done on this. That means that if you take cannabis, then you have a high risk of becoming addicted to it. So this, again, is something that you don't know who has that genetic pre predisposition because we don't all go around doing our genetic testing. So, again, some people, and this, again, is seen commonly in black communities, that you might take cannabis you might think oh i'm just taking it socially and then it becomes a problem because it becomes addictive and there are studies that link so we have studies that show this in the us in the uk but there are studies in nigeria that also show the use of uh, the, that link cannabis use in nigeria to psychosis development and an increased risk of schizophrenia so we see this in in our own country as well. The research has also been done locally. Now, you may ask, are there any medical benefits of cannabis? And the answer is that cannabis-derived treatments can be used in certain health conditions. For example, for certain severe types of uh, epilepsy, uh, cannabidiol, which is a derivative of cannabis, can be used for treatment. And also, cannabis-based medication can be effective in people with multiple sclerosis, chronic pain conditions, inflammatory bowel disease, in the treatment of chemotherapy, induced nausea and vomiting, and in palliative medicine. So this is when people are at coming to the end of life but even in those circumstances it's not without adverse events and the use of cannabis derived medications needs to be directed by a health professional in those settings this is very different from casual and social cannabis use um, and therefore this idea that cannabis is medicinal i think needs to be challenged because it's only in very certain prescribed uh, situations do we have any evidence at all that cannabis can be effective and in fact in a lot of other settings where we have looked at cannabis use there is inconclusive evidence that cannabis is helpful so um the idea that cannabis is medicinal is in many ways not true although in certain contexts as i've described it can be an effective treatment but as i said under uh, medical supervision now we also as i've said and I'm reiterating that we have convincing evidence that we should avoid cannabis use in adolescence and early adulthood, especially because of those risks of uh, 
schizophrenia and mental health disorders and cannabis uh, addiction that people will be more prone to. And again, in things like people with pregnancies, people with existing mental health disorders, it's a very bad idea um, to start or take cannabis because of all the uh, potential uh, harmful effects that can uh, ensue. Now, thinking about the psychological impact of cannabis on black mental health, we should think about mental health disorders. So increased cannabis use, as I've said, correlates with higher occurrences of mental health disorders. But this relationship is complex, and we have to understand that stress, trauma, poverty, and other psychological factors can influence uh, the use of, of cannabis. And for, for some people, the psychology of cannabis use is very much tied into the feeling is that they, it's, they feel it helps them relax. Now, this is, again, something that needs to be challenged because it can often be that, yes, it can make you feel uh, sleepy or, um, you know, uh, more kind of sedated. Uh, but is that actually relaxing? Because what we often see is rebound anxiety um, following the high and in the long term worsening uh, those mental health symptoms of anxiety or issues. So again, we need to think about the psychology of why do people want to take cannabis and understand it, but really then try and challenge it. Okay, so how did you feel the next day or afterwards? Did you actually feel relaxed or was it just in that moment that you felt uh, sedated? So did it actually... So we, we need to be challenging these ideas because this is often the psychology of why people feel um, that they want to smoke cannabis. Now, we cannot get away from addiction and dependency. And this is one of the things that the NDLEA is really trying to fight. And I really applaud their work in this because addiction and dependency can ruin lives. But it's the psychology of dependency. So when you get addicted, um, it can be very difficult to break that connection. And it can lead to all sorts of social vices in, in terms of people trying to be able to get that cannabis and pay for it. So it can actually cause people to then go into other things like theft or even prostitution and all so many other social vices in order to pay for that addiction. And again, it can ruin lives. People find themselves unable to hold down jobs, unable to uh, fulfill their requirements in their families. Um, and you, it can be very devastating. So again, the um, people then struggle, you know, th th they thought they were using cannabis for fun. And then they suddenly realize that there's no fun left because they have an inability to cut down and what they thought they had under control is now controlling them. And this, you know, difficulty of breaking through can be so difficult. And yeah, it's wonderful. Um, and we'll talk about this, what, what is needed to help people in this situation because, you know, help is available and, um, I was so, uh, it was so wonderful to hear Dr. Bafemi talk about the toll line that's available in Nigeria for, um, for calling uh, that which is staffed by doctors, psychiatrists and nurses to be able to provide, and psychologists to be able to provide that advice for people who are addicted to substances, including cannabis. Um, and so that psychology of, a, of addiction is something that we need to recognize and the, and the negative impact of it. So now let's think about the social impact. So socioeconomic factors underpin why a lot of people use cannabis. And I started to allude to that. So poverty, lack of education, and limited healthcare access 
Um, so people not knowing about the risks of cannabis, thinking again that it's fun, thinking again and not knowing the potential uh, problems, thinking that it's um, or something that it, it is easily controllable and not realizing that for some people it can actually take control of their lives. Again, poverty can lead to people feeling wanting escape from their situation and it's important to understand that a lot of people uh don't get into as cannabis use um because um they don't get into cannabis use because um they 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 get into it so I'll rephrase that and say a lot of people get into cannabis use because they feel they don't really have any choices. They just want to escape from very difficult situations. And we can understand that. It's just that there are alternatives um, and because it's not really a solution. It's a false solution. Um, and this can um, impact um, people's uh, well-being generally as well so not just their mental health but their physical health but these socioeconomic factors are a big reason why people get into cannabis use but it can also impact their ability to get treatment because if you don't have easy, easy access to health care or to uh, substance abuse uh, treatment if you if you are addicted or you have a family member that's addicted many people then turn to religious organizations or um, that which may not provide the help that they need they can provide some support so I'm not completely knocking the, the help that you can get from religious organizations but oftentimes this is a medical condition that requires medical treatment and there's medical um, you know ways to manage uh, substance abuse so when people come from you know that le lack of education may make people not be aware of the fact that this needs a medical approach to treatment um, and that can also impact care and outcomes the other thing that can occur is that there is uh, significant cultural acceptance in certain circles in Nigeria but alongside that there's also quite a lot of stigma and these two things rub side by side so in certain creative circles um, cannabis use is almost venerated as almost like a religious experience uh, we see that in Nigeria but we also see that in the Caribbean where you know cannabis use is seen as something that connects people to the the mystical or the spiritual um and this can affect people's how people see it now as i said so alongside that there is the fact that cannabis is illegal um and that creates stigma and barriers to seeking help and there are people who uh, stigmatize people um, or discriminate against people who uh, are addicted to cannabis and that can contribute to increased stress and mental health uh, issues so it's we we need to understand the the complicated social framework uh, in which we find ourselves and you know again challenge uh some of these ideas about the spiritual connection or um that mystic you know that um mythology mythology uh that mythologizing of cannabis um and also in the same way we need to be removing stigma people need to feel able to come forward and ask for help we need to be having more conversations about cannabis use um and therefore uh improve uh outcomes and treatments now um again environmental factors like the neighborhood in which people grow up in can influence cannabis use and mental health outcomes so areas of high crime rates where there's lack of social cohesion um, and increased stress can increase the likelihood of use so again 
that is something that we need to be challenging and looking at how we can improve our communities and not just abandon certain communities to their fate, but um, really think about how we can because they're young people in all these communities we cannot just abandon these young people to these high crime neighborhoods and say oh at least it's not my neighborhood we need to be thinking and I know that there's quite a lot of work um, that is being done in trying to address some of these uh, uh, issues in our community but we know that crime rates are very high because of the again it, it comes back to a lot of the socioeconomic uh, issues um, and uh, for a lot of people um, you know cannabis drives crime and crime drives cannabis um, and, 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 and you know we have to understand that relationship so um, we know that we face um, significant challenges with mental health and addiction care services. So we struggle with resources, trained professionals and infrastructure in Nigeria. I've already talked about stigma, which can impact people getting help. But then again, there's also our culture. Many of our cultures, um, you know, really, um, elevates the religious not that there's anything wrong with that and it's really i i'm i'm religious myself and you know my faith has helped me through many difficult situations but that you know it has to be uh, taken with medical uh, impact as well because the religious alone is unlikely to provide all the help that someone needs when dealing with uh, substance abuse um, challenges. So we need a comprehensive approach that addresses the biological, the psychological and social factors. And this needs to involve community education, awareness programs, uh, access to mental health and addiction services. So again, I must applaud NDLEA for having the toll free line that provides that access um, for people. And we need to try and get that information even more out there so that people know about it. And culturally sensitive interventions. So again, this is a challenge because uh, each, you know, there are multiple different uh, cultural variations uh, in terms of how people view or see cannabis. Um, I've mentioned two stark differences in terms of the people who venerate cannabis use and the people who judge and stigmatize cannabis use as an example of, of how we have different uh, cultural um, approaches, even within our own uh, Nigerian culture. Um, and then there will be very var variety of cultural nuances. We have so many different ethnic and cultural groups in Nigeria that will have different views and approaches to these things. So again, that culturally sensitive approach, uh, not being a bull in the china shop, and just you know, just you have to stop. You know, I think we have to understand why did they start in the first place. What is driving the reason why people have turned to cannabis? We've talked about a few of those things, but again, each person will have their own pers their own unique story, and so it's important that we um, have a non-judgmental approach and a culturally sensitive approach uh, in order to support the well-being of individuals. Um, uh, who might be addicted to cannabis. So in conclusion, so I'm coming to the end of the um, presentation, the main part of my talk, cannabis has significant biopsychosocial impact, and that's influenced by genetics, uh, psychology and mental health disorders, socioeconomic 
conditions, uh, discrimination, and the environments in which one has grown up in or lives in. And there needs to be a biopsychosocial approach, as I've mentioned uh, repeatedly. You're probably sick of hearing me say that now. To tackle the impact of cannabis use on the mental health of our communities. But we still need further research for better understanding and for better interventions because this is a big challenge. We don't have all the answers. We are trying to do the work to reduce cannabis related mental health issues in the Black community. Thank you so much for listening. All right, thank you very much, Dr. Sho. I <clears throat> definitely uh, would um, agree with all of those um, joining or, uh, yeah, joining this conversation from all across the world. And indeed, you have given a good account of yourself. There's no doubt about that. And we did appreciate you for that. Um, quite a number of um, those people that are probably speaking their mind. Um, they, uh, most, uh, I think, okay, the first person I want to mention here, I'm sure she will still find the time to ask for the microphone and uh, probably uh, try to engage with you on some of um, your points. And that's um, uh, Dr. Loretta. Dr. Loretta um, joins um, this conversation from Chicago, Illinois, the U.S. Thank you very much, Loretta. I'm sure... I'm going to be hearing from Loretta very soon because uh, I know I know her feelings and I know her thoughts fairly on some of these issues. Or I would also have um, John Ogunjimi. John Ogunjimi is a regular um, member of this platform. Thank you, John. Thank you, um, Uncle Deji. Thank you, Dr. Abdullah. Dr. Abdullah is um, a consultant psychiatrist at the Amadou Bello University Shin Hospital. He's also the director of Fraser Mental Health Foundation. Uh, through which uh, on which uh, handle is joining this conversation now. Okay, we also have um, another um, great advocate, Ibrahim Kuru. Ibrahim Kuru is um, um, joining us from the northeast uh, part of Nigeria. Thank you, um, Ibrahim. We also have Komre Mo. Komre Mo, thank you. Black Mind, Mohamed Bafo, Suleiman, Kabiesi. Adam Adimeji Ganiu, um, Priscilla Ogubike, TK, that's uh, Tinui Dou. Tinui Dou is also um, a medical practitioner joining us from um, Maryland, US. Thank you, Tinu. Thank you, TK, uh, for uh, being part of this conversation today. We also have uh, Oluwa Tokwe Joshua. Oluwa Tokwe Joshua, I also think, is joining us from the northeast part of uh, Nigeria. Thank you, Winnie. Um, Amit Bello, uh, Divide FX. I think that FX may suggest Forex. Then we also have um, Sati Mima. Sati Mima, thank you. We'll, have, uh, we'll continue to acknowledge um, all of our people on the platform. But now let's get to, um, let's get to the part where we'd have to engage with um, Dr. Sho. And like I said, I predicted because as I told you, that I know the thoughts of um, Loretta. And uh, just as I was about finishing that, she quickly grabbed, uh, moved to the speaker's corner, so would most likely um, give her the first um, shot. Let's um, get her thoughts and probably have questions um, uh, in your direction, Dr. Show. Loretta, please, if you are ready. Good morning, Good morning Dr. Show. Can everyone hear me? I keep correcting you that we are the time we have a time difference. Oh God, I'm so sorry. Sorry, I know, I know, I know. Please go ahead. So good evening, good afternoon, good evening, Nigeria, and um, same to Dr. Show. Uh, Dr. Show, thank you so so much. Let me tell you something quickly. When I saw um, what was shared for today's um, topic. But uh, family will bear with me. <laughs> yeah, so we are bringing medical doctors that are telling us about all the biological uh, treatment components. And he was like, no, you don't come again. So um, thank you so much for that awesome, professional, outstanding presentation. Um, let me just give a little background of what I do in Chicago. I work with the University of Illinois, uh, Illinois in Chicago. 
Um, I work with the city uh, department of um, Chicago Department of Public Health and um, the fire department. We um, implement a program called CARE. And what we do is um, once the um, EMT guys receive a 911 call for an overdose crisis or episode anywhere in the city of Chicago, they um, of course take them to the ER first and foremost to revive, resuscitate them with the use of um, malazin, Morcan. And what my team does is between um, 48 to 72 hours after they've been discharged, we try to follow them up. I work with um, a group of people we call peer recovery specialists. It means the people we work with are either having a living experience or they have a lived experience. The difference between both of them is that people with living experience, they are currently using, but they are using safely. It means they are adhering to all the harm reduction strategies being, um, being uh, stipulated to ensure that there is a prevention of overdose. And people with lived experience are people who have been able to stop using and they've been clean for quite a number of years, probably two, three years and all that. And so we work with this group to follow up people that have had the incidents or episode of overdose as data received from either the EMT fire department as the case may be. And what I experienced is we had more black folks who were overdosing. And among the black folks who were overdosing, the age category of the people who were having overdose fertility or death, uh, all the African American men between the age of 39 and 70, I mean, a lot of them were having that issue. And so in my dissertation, I kept asking myself, what could be the problem within this age category of people? And I said, could it be a cultural, um, an insensitive cultural approach in intervention? And so I began to deep dive. I began to look for data. And finally, I came up with a dissertation topic that, that looked at the inclusivity of culturally sensitive approaches particularly messaging in um, overdose uh, intervention. And when we were speaking today, I was like, yes, 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 yes. I'm not the only one in the desert crying, make a way. So I just want to say a very big thank you for, um, for how you have really simplified it because it's always difficult. And for all the medical doctors on the platform right now, I really want to apologize. It's no slight, I'm not slighting anybody or I'm not saying you don't do your job, but it's, after my experience, it's always very difficult for medical doctors to really break down, you know, the, the impact, the, um, the impact, the driving, the, the drivers of overdose or um, overdose or um, cannabis users, and you did an awesome job. I guess this is my second time I'm applauding a medical doctor who has really brought this explanation to the layman's level. And thank you so much. Now, my question will be. In all you've been doing, um, but Dr. Femi told me, I mean, you're one of the best practitioners in the United Kingdom. So well done, we're proud of you. Keep being the great ambassador that you are. What are you doing in your own, within your sphere of influence, within your sphere of control to provide support to the Nigerian community in the United Kingdom, because I know that I know that there's so much, because back here in Chicago, we have quite a handful of uh, Nigerians, but we don't have that community. It's always probably um, home, hometown or village um, meetings, or association, when they're having a party or something. But I'm still looking at how can I bring that community together and talk about what the harm, the associated harm with the use of any kind of substance is. So in your, I want to learn, in your own space in the UK, what are you doing with being that Nigerian community you know, to bring about increased awareness and supporting the people who are struggling with um, substance use in the United Kingdom? That would be my question.
And thank you so much. You did an awesome job. I wish I could hug you from where I am. Uh, you, you can, so you much, can do that online, Loretta. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Loretta. In fact, you have cheered my heart. I wonder if you might actually know my mommy and daddy, Chicago, uh, Professor and Professor Lokwade, Professor and Professor Mrs. Lokwade. In Honestly, I don't know them, but I'm, I'm happy to connect with them if you, if you can provide a platform for that. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. That's okay. Because I actually spend, I've spent a bit of time in Chicago myself. And I did my elective at the University of Chicago Medical Center. Right. So your question, hmm. it's a big question because it's something that we're working on. I do a lot of work in health equity and advocacy generally. So I consider myself to be a health equity, health equity advocate for the black community as a whole. Now, in the UK, we, we have very different um, black community to the US because, as you know, many of the black community in America are ethnically American in terms of their descendants from slaves and have been in America for generations and generations. Whereas most of the uh, black, we have a few um, based in Liverpool mainly who have who are descendants of slaves from uh, centuries ago. But the vast majority of the black community in Nigeria in in the UK are immigrants. So either immigrants from the Caribbean, and you may have heard of the Windrush generation or immigrants from Africa, um, of which Nigeria is probably the biggest. Um, Nigeria and Ghana are probably the biggest. Now, we have... I wouldn't say that we've always historically worked well together to improve our, our, our outcomes. But I think increasingly, I'll say in the last decade or so, we have become aware that our joint um challenges with healthcare um not just in addiction but in healthcare in general we have the worst healthcare outcomes in almost every specialty um and so we are now working together much better and um in fact just a few days ago i was in a uh, at an event called for with an organization called the caribbean and african health network who uh, do a lot of work uh, in supporting the black community including um education and uh, lots of the um health education health, health literacy supporting the black community and i uh, in october last year uh started something called health equity and advocacy learning it's called heal um and we educate the black community on issues that disproportionately affect the community um and it's addressed at all um of the community so within the nigerian community specifically i think we are we, many of us are doing a lot of work uh to integrate so for example i've got friends who are uh, part of the nigerian medical association called mansag we're doing a lot of work to um improve health outcomes for the black community as a whole but reaching out to our local communities as in a culturally sensitive manner so understanding the things that the for example nigerian community are interested in or the Ghanaian community or uh the caribbean community which obviously is also not a monolith and the different groups in there when it comes specifically to um drugs or substance uh, uh, uh problems i have to be honest I was, when i was doing my my psychology my psychiatry training I, I saw a lot of patients with um, substance abuse. And even when I was doing my general practice training, I did a psychiatry rotation and I was, I saw a lot of it. And when I, in my normal general practice, I see uh, patients that struggle with um, substance abuse, but uh, with HEAL, we haven't actually, and uh, we haven't actually done a program or an education program specifically around so, so this is actually a very good idea for me and it's homework uh, for us to actually um, and uh, you know partner with a lot of the health organizations because we're actually all starting to work together very closely as well many of the health organizations that focus on the black community so I wouldn't say that I have a very uh, 
I think the, the, the point is to try and create that cohesiveness. I mean, the event I went to last week that had Caribbean people, had Africans from everywhere. Because a lot of the time when we say Africans, we just see Nigerian culture, but there wasn't. There was South African culture. There was East African culture. It was so beautiful. And this one event brought the black community from all parts. It was actually held in a city called Manchester, which is in the north of England. And it had just the black community come together in such a beautiful way. So I think what we've got to be doing is how can we work with grassroots organizations? It's working together because I think doing things in silos is less effective. And I have found that since I've been working with other organizations collaborating, uh, we are moving the work forward better. Yeah, abs absolutely, absolutely. Thank you so much. That was an apt um, response. Um, very quick one. When you have a chance, I think we should. I'm happy to 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 connect, and we could begin. We could consider writing articles, papers, publishing stuff in this regard that is actually um targeted at the black community as a whole. An awesome job. I I took that when you said health equity and learning um platform. I, I think. Less. And advocacy um, learning. No, I love that. In fact, you could actually come and do some education for us on Heal. Um, for so we would love to have you. Um, so yes, please. I must get your contact details. I would love that. Awesome. Thank you. We'll, we'll come back after this after the program. Thank yes. you for the for me. All right. Thank you, um, Dr. Loretta. Thank you, Dr. Show. Okay, we. We have to move. I love that conversation. That's why I just kept quiet. I was enjoying the two beautiful women. All right. Up to the A few seconds. Acknowledge again um, some of our stakeholders on the platform. Seen Wari Pekin. Wari Pekin, thank you for being part of the conversation today. I've also seen Dr. Kolo. Dr. Kolo is a senior officer of the agency. That's NDLA. Mm -hmm. I've also seen Farouk Tanimu. Farouk Tanimu, thank you. I've also seen um, um, a major stakeholder here. That is uh, the bearded Dr. Shino. I think I saw him. I said he's disappeared. Dr. Be the bearded Dr. Shino has actually been on this platform uh, more than once. Thank you very much, the bearded Dr. Shino. All right. Um, Divine Forest, uh, do you have something to ask Dr. Shu or you want us to go on? Divine FX. Okay, if Divine FX is not um, talking, responding. Uh, again, I also like to appeal to, to all of our people who um, I can see for, um, Ibrahim Kuru struggling to um, get um, the mic, but I think his network is um, failing him. If you can't um, actually switch to uh, the speakers corner, please. You can send us a DM. Uh, I'll be going to our DM to read some of uh, the questions there now for Dr. Show to respond to. And I've also seen um, a veteran, an old veteran of this platform. That's uh, Perpetua Namdi Mane. Quite a while, Perpetua. I'm glad seeing your face here again today. Thank you, Perpetua. All right. Okay. I have seen uh, the bearded Dr. Shino back again. Thank you, Dr. Shino. All right, quickly, um, let me read this one from Ini. Um, Ini is asking Dr. Sho, um, I have read somewhere, and uh, Dr. Sho had also uh, made reference to that in her presentation that cannabis is beneficial for improving sleep and post-traumatic stress disorder. How can this um, be handled without... Uh, causing more harm than good if at all this is actually uh, medically and scientifically established. All right, over to you, Dr. Sho. I guess you got the question, right? I did. Um, okay. I didn't actually... I, so when it comes to uh, cannabis use in mental health disorders like post-traumatic stress, the ed evidence is actually not conclusive. So, and in, in any case, a lot of these medications that we, I said are used are derivatives from cannabis and not the, 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 the drug as smoked or inhaled. Um, the drug as smoked or inhaled is very high risk for abuse. So um, there are other forms which can be used in a medicinal um, uh, way. Um, there's uh, 
sort of THC oil that some people use um, and all of that. Now, the evidence for that is really not conclusive, but in those forms, the risk of addiction is much, much lower, right? So it, it kind of crystallizes the component that may have some uh, medical impact, but takes, a, takes out the component that can cause addiction. So I wouldn't be smoking cannabis and saying, oh, it's helping with my post-traumatic disorder, because probably it is not, and it's probably making it worse. And there are better and more effective treatments for uh, post-traumatic disorder, such as EMDR, which is eye movement uh, desensitization uh, therapy, uh, which I don't know if you've heard about. Um, there are far more effective treatments for um, for post-traumatic stress disorder and smoking or inhaling cannabis or uh, in its raw form is, is unlikely to help with that. So I just, I was just, I'm giving context to say that there are some medicinal uses and the de derivatives of cannabis, you know, the evidence is not fully there, but some people, ha you know, say, I found it useful. And on that basis, you know, there are, you can buy derivatives of cannabis um, legally um, in many countries in the world uh, for treatment of certain conditions. Uh, but that is very different from smoking or um, inhaling or eating uh, cannabis. All right. Thank you. There. Um, again, uh, Dr. Shaw, always um, giving a good account of us. So, all right. To like to go again back to our DM. Um, I have this one um, from Ediba. Ediba is asking three questions. But well, let me see if Dr. Show has um, pen and paper there that I can ask the three questions to go. Otherwise, I mean one. Uh -huh. I believe I answered that that already answered that. Next one is asking how does cannabis use alter brain chemistry and neurotransmitter activity? That's um, his or her first question. The next question is uh, how does cannabis use affect interpersonal relationships within families and friendships? Okay. And the last one, third one, the chance for mental depression. Still talking on the use of cannabis. I believe you, are, you have also addressed this, but then you can um, uh, speak to this, Dr. Shaw. Sorry, I didn't hear the third question very clearly. It froze. Okay, the third question, I believe, is something you have taken care of. Um, that is, what are the implications for mental health conditions such as anxiety and depression? Still talking of the use of cannabis. Okay. So how cannabis, so cannabis interacts with the brain's endocannabinoid system. And it's in that way it can alter uh, the brain function. Um, and as I was explaining in the first part of my talk, I don't know if you missed that, uh, that uh, interference uh, with uh, with the brain structure and function can lead to cognitive problems and is why we think that it's associated with this increased risk of psychosis and uh, mental health conditions. And this is especially noted in adolescents. So as I was explaining, the brain generally tends to de continue developing till 25. So I know that we're allowed to drink in, certain, in most countries in the world, you can drink alcohol from 21 um, and you can drive from 18, but <laughs> your brain is still developing, uh, usually until the age of 25. And so at that stage, the brain is still at risk or even at higher risk of developing these alterations that might ev eventually result in mental health issues. Um so the second question was about interaction with family and friends. 
Now, as I was explaining, cannabis use is very complex, right? In certain, in certain uh, social environments, it's positively encouraged. People are like, you know, it's something fun to do. Let's smoke a joint. Let's 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 get let's get some drinks. Let's smoke a joint, and it's something that people do as a social uh, function. And I was even explaining that in certain creative uh, environments, uh, cannabis use can even be venerated. Um, and in certain uh, social environments, um, it's discriminated against and it's seen as something very, very bad. And I think it's important to have a non-judgmental approach um, and, uh, and question why someone wants to use cannabis and if they fully understand the risk. I mean, in Nigeria, it's illegal. Um, so I think that's, that's it's illegal. Um, and that, you know, draw the line in the sand uh, really about cannabis use but uh, we know that a lot of young people are using it um, and so it can as I say have very devastating effects on on psychology and uh, increased dependence so uh, uh, cannabis addiction uh, and substance abuse uh, as I said they're genetic predispositions so we don't know who uh, can uh, develop that but and that can result in huge problems because people are then looking for money to fund their substance abuse and that can result in a breakdown in family relationships people even end up stealing from their family and friends uh, they are be they become unreliable so you can't trust them or trust what they're going to say um and it can really cause a breakdown in relationships now for those who say oh i use it and there's no uh impact on my social um on my on my on my mental health or my social situation or or, or that well uh maybe you've been lucky but actually um we don't know who is going to be impacted by these problems and therefore uh, as a society this is something that has caused serious serious harm and that's why we should be encouraging people to stay away from cannabis uh, because of the potential uh, uh, negative impacts Thank you, dear. Um, stay away from cannabis because of its negative impact. Thank you. Um, that's um, one of um, our takeaways from Dr. Shaw's um, yeah, presentation and um, response to some of the questions. Okay, we go to the next uh, question. Um, okay, this one is... Uh, let me see if this one has been answered. Omo is asking, what measures can one take to assist someone who is trying to... Okay. Uh, Omo is asking, what measures can one take to assist someone who is showing signs of psycho uh, impact from cannabis? Then um, the second leg of his or her question, how can we differentiate between... How can we differentiate symptoms from... How can we differentiate symptoms from cannabis use compared to other substances? Okay, how can we differentiate symptoms of cannabis use compared to other substances? Did you get that, Dr. Ocho? Um, kind of. Um, so the first question was about... Um, ooh. Uh, the first question is, what measures can one take to assist someone? Right. Who is showing signs of psycho uh, something from psychosis? Right. So this is really um, this is really a difficult one because when a family member or a friend is showing signs of psychosis, it can be really really scary because you can almost see that separation with reality. And you're so worried about what they may or may not do in terms of harming themselves or others. Um, and they might be very paranoid. Uh, they might be seeing things that are not there. They might be hearing things that are not there. I think the first thing you need to do is to get help. This is a, this is a medical state that needs medical treatment. Uh, very, it's, it, 
people who are not trained cannot handle it. It's a bit like if somebody is having a heart attack and saying, let's go call the pastor. Do not do that. Go and call a doctor. It's the same thing. If someone is having a psychotic episode, who you need in that moment is a psychiatrist, a doctor. Because also the treatments that the person gets and the, 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 uh, the, the, the quickness by which that person gets that treatment can impact the outcomes later. So very, very crucial to get that person to a psychiatric specialist who can start them on correct medication and um, make sh and help them get the help that they need. And often people will need medications for a considerable period of time. So usually um, at least six months to a year, maybe even longer, depending on how bad the psychosis is. Now we can div divide it into first episode of psychosis or whether they've had recurrent psychosis. A first episode of psychosis is so important to get that treated as quickly as possible because once people start having recurrent psychosis, it is incredibly difficult to manage and very difficult for them to get back to a high quality of life. So treatment by a specialist who knows what they're doing is really, really important. Um, and then the second part of the question, how, I, I mean, I, I, what I understand the question to mean is how do you differentiate between someone just being high and someone who is uh, having um, a psychotic breakdown? And I think, you know, it's that uh, sometimes it's very difficult to differentiate. And this is why highs can be actually very dangerous because, you know, you've, you, we, we've heard of and seen people having a high and doing things that put themselves or others at risk. But generally speaking, it passes. But with psychosis, it seems to be more sustained uh, and prolonged. You, generally speaking, when people are high, you... You try and get them in a safe place, let them sleep it off, and the cannabis gets out of their system, and they generally will recover. But if you're getting sustained uh, behavior that is abnormal, um, the person seems to have lost touch with reality, as I was explaining, seeing and hearing things that are not there, and this seems to be going on for a considerable period of time, um, so days, this is a medical emergency. You need to get help. All right. For medical emergencies, please do get help. Thank you, dear Dr. Show. Okay, before we get to um, invite another person who may want to ask questions or make contributions, let me um, quickly acknowledge some of these people again. Uh, Udara at uh, Uju, I guess Udara is um, a nurse, uh, a midwife, um, somewhere along the line. Thank you very much, Udara. I would also have uh, Okoro Suleiman. Okoro Suleiman, I believe, is a medical doctor. Thank you, um, Okoro Suleiman. We also have uh, Victoria O at Vicoli. Thank you, uh, Victoria, for being part of the conversation today. Now, um, I think um, Dr. Shon has um, probably uh, made an impact somewhere that had to draw perpetual out of her hiding place because quite for weeks now, I've not really seen her and here. Apesha is coming out to ask um, for the mic, but because she's um, she is um, she's been a steadfast member of this uh, space, I like to invite uh, Papesha and I'm the man. Let's um, hear from her. Papesha, please go ahead. Okay, so thank you so much for this question. Thank you, Sai. Thank you, Papesha, for your presentation. It was quite an um, insightful one. And um, I don't want to make any contribution in it, but I just want to say thank you because I've learned a lot. And I know that um, first time I have um, some contributions and some questions to ask. Thank you so much, my favorite. Thank you, sir. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Papesha. Uh, Dr. Shaw, uh, you have another um, admirer there. She's not just interested in making any. Uh, contribution, but she just wants to appreciate you for your presentation. Um, from which she says, she's, she says she's learned um, quite a lot. All right, thank you there. Um, okay, let me take um, the next question from Janet. Janet is asking. Um, 
Okay. Uh, what are okay? The, okay. Let me ask. I think I have seen two questions. What are the societal implications of cannabis legalization of mental health services and public health? And I guess um, she's asking your view on this. What are the societal implications of cannabis legalization of mental health? services and public health initiatives then the second part of our question is what are the long-term implications of chronic cannabis use on mental health i believe you have answered that the second part um, earlier but then you can still wrap um, you can still wrap that up in just few seconds um, but i think the first question you may want she's trying to get your view on that please go ahead right so this is a very i think polarizing question. Now, um, I, and I also think it's a political question. <laughs> and we said no politics. <laughs> well, Uh, but it's not, I'm not a politician, so it's not really um, my, uh, uh, my decision, it's the decision of the state and the government and people who are in power. Uh, but I would say that if I was advising, I would say, can we focus our energies on actually targeting what, why are people uh, going towards these medications rather than focusing on criminalizing uh, our young people. All right, thank you, Ben. Yeah, so... Can I just say something? Uh, that's okay. Okay, please go ahead. Um, I, I think, um, I don't think, sorry, um, I, I, I commend that Dr. Shu um, did um, justice to that question. Um, if, if you allow me, um, from the public health um, perspective, as a public health practitioner myself, I would want to first and foremost commend NDLA because before now, we've always perceived or seen the NDLA um, organization as um, um, a punitive um, harm of the government that throws people in jail once they know that you either have possession or you use um um, um, what's um, cannabis, marijuana, igbo, or something. However, in the I think in the last few months that I have been on this platform, I have seen that they've made very um, intentional and deliberate effort, you know, to change the narrative by um, coming up with this particular program to say, you know what, we are not really after the demand side that much, but we are, I mean, really going to put punitive measures around the supply side. And that's the same where who are the people bringing in these drugs or the substances? Who are the people cultivating them and who are the people selling them? Because of course the social determinant of um, um, cannabis use or drug use will always be there. And I think on this platform, they continuously by educating the public know that, you know what guys, we are not after you. If you're going, if you have any challenges, um, if you know someone that has um, 
um, drug use um, issues, substance use disorder, or that is struggling with the harm associated with the use of all the substances, including, of course, cannabis and all that. Let us know, and that's why they have the helpline. However, as much as they are doing, there's still very low level of sensitization because I am a strong advocate for health promotion and health prevent health promotion and health prevention. There's still very, very low activity, commitment, policies around, you know, um, increasing um, like Dr. Show is I mean advocating the literacy, equity across the country. And of course, it has a lot to do with um, ethnicity, has a lot to, with, to do with classism, it has a lot to do with tribe and all those um, on the sub people. So there's still so much to do because people still do not know. People still do not have access to available services. People, the government have to come to terms with the fact that there is need to integrate have under one roof if possible. Can we recall when we had the HIV surge? Can we recall when we had the HIV problem all over the world and in Nigeria, like in, in, every, in every six persons in, in, in those days, one person was infected with HIV and there was so much discrimination, there was so much of a, 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 a bias and a mistreatment of people who were infected. But today, we have family members who are living happily with the virus, who their CD4 count has reduced so much that, I mean, there is no, I mean, it, it, it's as good as not being there. Because the government went all out in terms of policy, implementation, promotion, prevention. They went with the ABCD. But when it comes to drug use, when it comes to substance abuse, we see it as a moral default. We see it as a moral problem. We saw HIV infection as a moral issue. So I think there's a lot that the government can do from the place of decriminalizing the use, not the supply or the purchase, the use. And like Dr. Shio said, we need to go to the root cause of why homelessness, poverty, now with the economy all over the world, like I usually say, people will find a way to distress and they will always identify an escape route for their stress, for their problems, for their poverty, for their frustration, for their depression. And this is the time when the government is, will say, you know what, how do we help? Because it's like the question said when we started, addiction and dependency, a way of escape from to, to, to distress will always be there as long as the human race exists. If we could win HIV, we can win drug use issues in Nigeria. Thank you. I yield the mic. All right, thank you for finally allowing me to have um, to have uh, control of the mic. Um, Loretta, we appreciate that. Um, thank you, Loretta. Um, once again, uh, I, I quite appreciate um, the submissions of Loretta there and um, the fair remarks about um, the uh, metamorphosis or the kind of um, revolution sort of development um, happening within the operations and the activities of the agency. However, I would still like to put it on record that the law in Nigeria today um, does not um, allow anybody to possess or use any of these things. But in line with best global places, the agency is trying to reform and that's why exactly we are bringing support to all of those people who are using um, illicit substances to provide support for them and also to work with the other stakeholders. Um, this, again, we also have to appreciate the fact that this is beyond government, just like um, you did say to Dr. Sho, um, even in the UK where she is, she has a sphere of influence, and that's one of the things we are also trying to uh, make um, tap into that is using her wealth of um, experience and also her knowledge to also uh, get her engaged to share some of this with um, our stakeholders in this part of the world. So this uh, basically, um, it's not just all about government. And um, as we can see, the agency keeps um, 
uh, working hard to engage with all of our stakeholders, starting from the federal level down to the state, the local government, getting the state drug control committees, local government control committees, that is, um, engaging with the government at those levels to uh, put some of these things in place. And that's why you will see that um, rather than punishing those um, uh, who, I mean, these people uh, that are um, abusing these substances, we will rather encourage them to come out and seek treatment, and that's the position of the agency today. But then we also have to realize so that uh, some people will not go on overdrive, thinking that um, it's all free for them out there. That's just trying to chip in that so that um, uh, some people will not go out there and be misrepresenting uh, what um, Loretta is talking about and saying. Thank you once again. Uh, let's um, uh, see, Doc, I mean, Comrade Arty. Comrade Arty, um, you want you have a question or a contribution? Uh, I have a contribution. Please go ahead quickly. Okay. Uh, like I heard uh, Miss Loretta and uh, Dr. Shows talk, and yes, they came from a health practitioner point of view. But I am a data analyst, and me, I'm coming from a point of view which is based on best practices. And if you look at it here, most people, and before I start, I would like to commend NDLA for the work they've been doing in Nigeria. Uh, before time, everyone had always stereotyped uh, smoking weed as the major drug use in Nigeria, which a lot of us knew that that was not actually the major problem, that Nigerians were open to other drugs like cocaine, crack, and heroin, and all. And if you notice now, most of the busts that they've been doing are actually major illicit drugs. And these are actually the drugs that have actually had... Uh, negative effects on the youth. It's it's been shown on uh, practice around the world how these drugs have actually destroyed cities and destroyed lives around the world. U.S. best practice in the 80s when cocaine started flowing in through Miami, the way Miami became, everyone lost their jobs and people were all homeless. But Based on best practices, uh, weed, you've never really heard any news of weed like that. For example, uh, in South America, it was uh, Chile or was it Uruguay, one of them. They legalized weed and their crime rate actually dropped because it was put on a controlled point of view. So uh, looking at uh, I, I, and the whole idea of NDLA trying to do an open space on Twitter where they know it's filled up by youth is actually an attempt with them. I know obviously they work with data analysts as well that have shown how best practices if uh, cannabis is actually put on a controlled way uh, through a medic medicinal point of view or science, because I know even at a point it was raised up in House of Rep on using it for scientific and medicinal use, but it was pushed away. And uh, countries like Canada have actually tried this. And if you check it, the highest earning company, which is actually pushing the ca Canada economy, is actually a cannabis company. And these are things that other countries have looked into and they are working towards to decriminalize it because they know that the main drugs that actually destroy lives are actually out there. So, and yes, we actually have their the negative effects, but with what I think other countries have done based on best practices, if it's being controlled, it's not something that is open to be sold by anyone and all, and it's only meant to be on a prescription point of view for medicinal use only, or maybe for scientific research, and maybe limit the recreational use as well as, uh, as, an, as a pilot to understand, to see the effect. I feel it would actually work and they would actually achieve what they are heading to. So that's just, thank you very much for allowing me to drop this contribution. All right. Thank you, dear comrade um, RT. Okay. Uh, like, uh, it's like somebody set up Dr. Show because um, where, uh, where Dr. Dr. Show raised the alarm that it's uh, like the last question from, uh, what was that? I think, uh, Janet was setting her up for a polarization. Uh, for <laughs> and I guess um, Comrade RT has picked it up from there. Okay, um, I think um, let's, um, since uh, Loretta and Dr. Shaw are speaking from uh, the diaspora, let's, um, let's get their response. I have mine, and um, 
my position absolutely aligns with the position of uh, the agency and the government of Nigeria. But then I think I uh, prefer at this point to allow um, either Loretta or Dr. Show to speak to um, what um, Comrade R.T. has just said. Um, yeah, thank you so much for your contribution. Um, and uh, please don't get me wrong. Um, I'm not here to judge. I'm here to I'm here to present um, medical facts. Um, we know that there are uh, drugs, illicit drugs, that have a worse effect um, on uh, physical, mental health, and lives than cannabis. That's 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 a fact. Um, but that doesn't mean that cannabis doesn't have a detrimental effect on lives and on mental health. Um, in particular, um, as I've highlighted, it's about the risk um, to uh, mental health, particularly amongst young people who might take cannabis whilst their brains are still developing, and it might alter their brain function and put them at increased risk of mental health disorders in their future. And that is something that I'm not sure how 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 well people are aware of that. So can people, you know, there is is there scope for medical use of cannabis derived medication? Um, I already said that in my talk that there is. Um, I'm not in a place of judgment. I'm just saying that this is a medication, this is a uh, substance that carries high risk to mental health, but also to an individual's life if they develop uh, a, a addiction to the to the medic uh, to the substance. We know that um, there are people who use cannabis recreationally, but are not addicted to it. You know, but when people are addicted to it, it can be life devastating to their lives and their families. So that's kind of where we're we're bringing this up from. I I don't have any like as I've explained, I don't necessarily um, subscribe to the criminalization of cannabis use, um, but that's not my call. In Nigeria, it's illegal, um, and even in the UK, it's still illegal. Um, Although they've, it's, it's not, you know, they're classes of illegal medication. So it's not as high as some classes, but it's still illegal in the UK. So there is a reason why it is illegal in certain of the, in certain uh, countries. And we're thinking about the amount of use of cannabis as well. So um, I think that you have to pull all the, you know, we have to pull all the different aspects together. And as I say, instead of, and I, just, I reiterate Dr. Loretta, let's stop focusing on criminalization of users and instead think of the why and really try and target our interventions against those ills of society that are driving people towards cannabis use and other uh, recreational drugs. All right, thank you. I, I would just add a bit, I would just add a okay. bit to that. Okay, sorry. please go ahead. Um, I actually invited the two of you. Please go ahead. Um, thank you so much, Comrade. I, I think um, you're spot on. And um, I happen to be a data, a data person as well. I've been using data all my career. In fact, you, it's okay to call me um, a data um, analyst or stuff. I mean, I've been doing uh, monitoring evolution for over a decade. And I'm really, really big on data because data actually um, provides guidelines to intervention. However, in terms of criminalization of the criminalization of the, I mean, of, um, um, of the use of supply and all that, and let me just say, thank you for clarifying you know, um, what I said, um, so I'm not misquoted. Before now, I used to be very, um, I used to be very pushy about change, change, let this happen, let this happen. But as I continue to, I mean, work in my space and I continue to grow, I am still growing in career and, um, and all of that, I realized that most of the time, change cannot come when there is no readiness. 
a people, a group of people, if an individual is not ready for change, whatever you do might not have the kind of effect that you you had set out to see or to have better words, result or outcome. When I conducted the research somewhere in those um, in, somewhere in the southwest part of Nigeria about the readiness to readiness to adapt harm reduction for substance use in Nigeria, I realized that we are not there yet because the health literacy on education around the use of substance, what substances there are, the effect of these substances is still very low. We are still at a point where if people do not know, they cannot understand the, the implications or the effects thereof. So, um, recently in the US, the, in Oregon, they decriminalize um, substances, the use of substance. So, I mean, if you're caught with um, whatever kind of substance, you don't go to jail, they take you to a health, a health facility. But now, People are beginning to say, you know what, we think we made a mistake by saying that. And why is that? They are not saying let's reverse it. They are not saying we think people are not ready. We need to put out more information out there. So as much as the whole world or some countries are decriminalizing, I am not for decriminalizing or criminalizing. No, I think I, I have shifted. I'm now at a corner to say before that happens, are we ready? Before we begin to decriminalize, what are the factors, what are the things on ground that is able to elevate or cushion the effects when we decriminalize? Is Nigeria there yet? That question I cannot answer. We need to do a whole lot of research. And when Dr. Shu was quoting her data from Nigeria, we are still having 2018 data. The last that was, a, I think that's the last day that we have for drug use issues in Nigeria. It is time that NDLA, UNO, UNO, ODC, and other agencies, we need to do another research and be deliberate about the indicators and be deliberate about what we want to see. So this data can actually inform next steps in terms of policy, policy and practice. I yield the mic. All right, thank you there. I'll just um, take it off from where Loretta um... Post there because I say post, I deliberately use that word uh, because um, indeed, uh, speaking of the last um, 2018 data, it was actually released um, that year or even 2017, but it was released for 2017 and published 2018. Uh, so, invariably, that data is uh, six years old. And I tell you that uh, for the past two or three years, um, we've been um speaking with uh, all our uh, partners and stakeholders to see how uh, this is not solely um about the agency now this is um um about um uh, the country uh, that is the federal government of nigeria and other stakeholders our international partners especially that had supported us um in the last one and uh, don't forget that um that um, that particular exercise was supported by a 10-year funding program from the EU, uh, which was managed by the UNODC, and um, because that program had since um, um, expired or ended, um, I think um, last year or the previous year. So we're now looking for we're getting promises here and there to see how another survey could be conducted, but then. Um, we're not there yet, and we hope uh, that will be done. Having said that, I would also like to, uh, based on the, the position by what uh, Comrade um, uh, Artis said, um, if you see one of the things, because he was uh, more or less speaking from um, the economic benefits of um, legalizing cannabis, I guess, as uh, I hope I'm not misquoting him, um, the, from that uh, for us, um, we look at that if, um, again, coming from um, on the heels of what Loretta just said, that um, we're not there yet. We're not there yet. It, that's not just about the government, the law, about the citizens themselves. Because if um, you have um, um, a particular substance, in this case cannabis, that is not legalized, and um, as at the last um, 
survey, we have 10.6 million Nigerians abusing that particular substance. Only God knows how many uh, six years after. Even though I know that um, the agency has been going all out, whether in the forest, on the waters, wherever we find um, that particular substance, we've, also, we've tried to... Um, to uh, deal serious um, deadly blows on the cartels um, behind them, cannabis plantation, production, and even trafficking because of the huge number of Nigerians abusing that. So for us, we look at it, okay, if uh, we have 10.6 million out of 14.3 uh, million Nigerians that that survey showed um, um, were abusing illicit so 10.6 million of them, and then um, so if we decide to just uh, fold our hands and throw the door, I mean, the gates open, uh, that could, uh, will, could probably, before you know it, there is the fear that um, we may be having um, 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 a junkies republic all around us, and um, nobody will want to wait to see that because um, that's the, the fact that, upon the fact that it's still an illegal, and um, an illegal substance that you have that huge population of people abusing that, which is um, uh, far more than the population of a, no a number of uh, African and European countries. That's um, not an acceptable figure, and that's why the Nigerian government has been very opposed to that. And uh, when you talk of the economic benefits, again, we also look at uh, the fact that um, when, um, when you have to, when you have, um, uh, where you have uh, where you have to make say like ten million dollars from exporting uh, or the sale of um, this particular substance, and at the end of the day, uh, we don't have um, all the institutions or the facilities in place to take care of um, those that may uh, I mean that would um, need support services or uh, medical treatment or all of those things in place. That's talking. That's I guess what uh, Loretta was talking about, and. Um, that could be uh, a disaster. Wait, wait, I mean, waiting, and that is um, using gaining ten million on the one hand, and you have to look for like say fifty billion dollars also on the other hand to put facilities in place. So when you put all of those arguments together, it's still a very dicey and dangerous situation. That's just to put things um, still trying to add to the argument um, position taken by Comrade uh, RT there, and um, which was also spoken to by Dr. Loretta. Thank you very much, everybody. would also like to appreciate Quiet and Shy at um, Akola Des Ola. And, sorry, uh, Dr. sorry, can I add something, please? Uh, you have to, the, our time is fast spent now. Um, comrade, <laughs> sorry, I'll we're make just, it, I'll make we're it just, if I'll you make have to quick. speak on that two seconds. Okay, please. talking about illicit, uh, if you go back to ground zero, illicit is being labeled as anything that affects you, your mental behavior in a way. Back then, alcohol was illegal before they made alcohol legal as well, and they started moving step. We can never get that change or get there if we don't take a step. One of the ways to best sensitize the use of cannabis is even by if they if they start making it like the way uh, Canada and US did when they legalized it. Everyone that was actually a user was registered under the country. The country was able to know who is using it, and to know the level at which they did some experiments, to know the behavior effect on this, on the different people that were labeled as users compared to other drugs. And that was why these countries were able to take the step. And they did not make it in all the countries, because in all parts of the country, because they knew that the level of uh, literacy around the country varies. So they, took, they started from where there were higher level of literacy, where you can easily sensitize people that you know that, yes, this sensitization will be resensitized to a low, lower level of person. And that way, it was put under control. This is based on best practice and data, not my world. Uh, thank all right. Th thank you very much, uh, Comrade. Sorry, sir. Comrade. I, 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 I agree with you, but the question remains, do we have a functional database in Nigeria? That's yes, number we do. one. Number two, you, number two, sir. Number two, sir. It's a database. You can yes. see, like, see, there are things happening in the Nigerian government that they don't put out there for in the public that if you don't really do your research, you'll never know. The country okay. has very strong. They try getting a police report. You can't get a police report if you don't have a functional BVN or NI number, and the email address linked to that BVN or NI number is functional. You cannot get it. 
Okay, so, I, 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 I agree with you, but I agree. Good. But another another thing I was going to mention is, do you know that I don't know if you heard about fentanyl? Fentanyl. Do you know that even cannabis is being mixed with all sorts of other drugs? For example, fentanyl is a terrible thing. For every substance out there right now, to increase the number of people who are purchasing based on the strength and the power and the potency, fentanyl is being added to everything right now. It's mixed with everything. How yeah, are we poor? Thank, thank you very much, Loretta, dear. I think if, to buttress what Loretta just said, I'll tell you that, you see, these things are very dicey, very delicate, and very complicated and complex. I don't mind my um, repetition, but then the, the truth is, I'll tell you what um, may not have been said out there, that recently some of the interceptions, um, some of the interdictions that the agency had at um, one of the ports in Nigeria, some of the substances seized there, which... Uh, were taken to be um, 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 a variant of cannabis, were discovering that, I mean, they are synthetic, uh, absolutely, but then we're now discovering that there are much more to what um, was believed after we have to, after we had taken the this through a uh, laboratory analysis and all of those things. So that's to show that indeed some of these things that you even call cannabis, there is much more to it. So that makes it, very complex and complicated. So it's not, a, and I know it's not a conversation for just I me, mean, for just two hours. Anytime I prepared for it, I knew that this was going to uh, bring some uh, controversy and some polarization, if I will use the word of uh, Dr. Show. Okay, at this point, um, we, we our time is fast spent. We're even past the hour, so I'd like to invite Dr. Show to give her a parting shot. We'd like to appreciate her once again. Dr. Show, please... Um, I know, I mean, um, um, Loretta and uh, Comrade uh, Arty has, I mean, they've kept you quiet since, but then I have to take charge and um, get, allow you to get um, um, your last parting words out there so that we can close uh, this conversation for today. Thank you. All I have to say is thank you. Thank you for this lively conversation. I'm so happy to see that people are passionate. Passion is always an important thing. I can't I can't express how grateful I am to have been invited to share. Um, this is a really important conversation. And I'm so glad that NDLA is taking leadership and leading on this and actually providing uh, support for the people who need it. And I'm here for any support that you need in the future. Well, I appreciate that. Once again, we'd like to appreciate Dr. Itunu Johnson Sogbetun, also uh, popularly called Dr. Sho. She is um, the highly experienced UK-based general practitioner with a strong commitment to the holistic well-being of her patients. We appreciate her. She spent the last two hours of her time. We know how precious um, her time is every Every minute there is, um, uh, according to the people, according to uh, Loretta and her people, every minute, every second is dollarized. But in her case, is um, I don't know how to say it with pan, pan. Is it pan? <laughs> every minute counts. Every second counts for all our compatriots out there. Because and here we have uh, Doctor Show providing or giving two hours of her time without um, any remuneration to support. Um, what we're doing. Indeed, um, we say we're grateful, and I can tell you um, that um, um, the Chairman Chief Executive of the Agency, General Mohamed Buba Marwa, appreciates um, um, he's busy at the moment, but definitely at the end of each of these conversations, he listens to it, and um, in no time, definitely, he'll be interacting with um, our, uh, our guest speakers. Uh, that's why we created a platform, a forum for all our guest speakers, um, so that um, at this time it's a conversation we still have this week. He'll be interacting with all of you just to appreciate you uh, because he listens to all of these things and is appreciating all your contributions. Uh, once again, I appreciate um, Dr. Loretta. Um, she joined us from Chicago, Elena. Thank you. John Ogu, Jimmy, Uncle Deji, Dr. Abdullah, Dr. Abdullah is of the Amadou Bello University Teaching yeah. Hospital, Zaria, Ibrahim Kuru, John, okay, um, Comrade Mo, Blank Mai, Mohamed Bafo, Suleiman, Kabiesi, Adam, Adimeji Ganiu, Priscilla, um, Priscilla, TK, TK is at Tinu Idowu, Tinu Idowu is a medical practitioner, also joined us from um, Maryland, US, Oluwa, Tokwe, Joshua, Winnie, Ak Amit Bello, Divine FX, Sati Mima, um, Wari Pekin, Dr. Kolo, Farouk Ta 
Tanimu, the bearded Dr. Shino, Papesha Nam de Mane, Udara at Uju, Okoro Suleiman, that's Dr. Okoro Suleiman, Victoria O, Comrade Arti, Quiet and Shy at Akola Days, Ola, Dr. Najim Salam, Omoba, and the whole lot of others who appreciate all of you. And I also like to appreciate all my colleagues who have been working behind the scenes with me here that um, talking of Shidi, Musa, um, Francis, um, Mahmoud, Dele, uh, Val, Kumbi, Neta, Blessing, and the rest of you guys, let's know which um, more time on that. Um, so I appreciate everyone. Um, next week, Friday, is another time. Just remember that this conversation is recorded, so you can always go to any of our handle, social media handles, um, take a listen again, or even share with your loved ones so that they can benefit from this conversation, from the facts, knowledge, and experience that have been shared on this um, uh, this platform today. Until we come back next Friday at 3 p.m. to um, discuss another topic. I'm yours sincerely, Femi Baba Femi. Please do enjoy your weekend and enjoy moderately. I hand you over to my colleague, Mahmoud, please. Thank you very much, sir. As you rightly said, this brings us to the end of the program. For more information about the agency, our listeners.